Searching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everybody. Your host, Michael, joined uh, here in just a moment by Dr. Larry Chapp, bringing him back on the show. I uh, am going to have him on for a conversation about the Second Vatican Council, and I'm really excited about this. In fact, I was recently listening to a video of his on Vatican II with another uh, channel, and it was really, really insightful. And I thought, you know, there's, there's quite a few things that I agree with him on the Second Vatican Council. And uh, it's kind of rare to hear his per, uh, the, the perspective that he offers these days. It's a very balanced approach. So I really appreciate it and uh, happy to have him back on. Of course, he, if y'all aren't familiar, is a uh, former professor of DeSales University. He taught there for over 20 years. And he's also um, a author and founder of Gaudium et Spes 22 Dot com. Definitely go and check it out. Really good articles there. Bringing Dr. Larry Chap coming up next. Dr. Chap, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Michael. It's great to be back. Yeah, you know, I'm really excited about this. As I said, you know, at the introduction there, I was listening to one of your videos on the Second Vatican Council, and I thought it was really balanced. And so I think that you offer a really nuanced perspective that most people aren't um, providing these days. They tend to be pretty extreme. You know, I would say most people affirm the hermeneutic of rupture, whether they're conservative or liberal, they see the Second Vatican Council as rupture, whereas it sounds like you would see it more as a hermeneutic of reform and continuity. Yes, yes, yes. No. Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I'm basically taking my, this is no genius on my part. This is the genius of Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, who in discussing the Second Vatican Council, of course, rejects the notion that it represented a radical rupture with the tradition, which is an increasingly popular point of view these days. Mainly, I mean, the progressives, the liberals have always advocated some notion that it was a great reset. It was a great restart. It's a second reformation. So let's get on with it. But now we've got this re-energized rad trad element of the church that is saying the same thing. Absolutely. Whereas the progressives say, hey, it was it was a rupture and that's a good thing. The rad trads say that it's a rupture and that's a terrible thing. So we just need to roll the clock back to 1955 and and, and just reject the council and, and get beyond it. Whereas Benedict comes along and says, no, 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 this is all silly. Every great council represents a partial rupture with the past, uh, although it is a de in, in the pursuit of a deeper continuity, because a council isn't called unless there's some sort of problem that it's trying to address, okay? Some issue has cropped up, okay? And so oftentimes what has happened is that some aspect of the church has been exaggerated at the expense of other aspects of the church. And so a council gets called, in a sense, to rupture with the exaggeration in order to reconnect with the sort of mainstream tradition. And all councils do this. So Vatican II was no different. Its basic claim was that, hey, look, uh, Neo-scholasticism and that kind of theology is great, but it really has gotten to the point where it's a kind of oppressive hegemony in the church, and we need to, you know, we need to expand our horizons. And and so the, the Vatican II ruptured, in a sense, with the dominance of neo-scholastic theology, without rejecting it entirely, but with the, with the dominance of it in favor of what is called resourcement theology, which is a fancy term that means a theology that wants to go back to the broader sources of scripture and patristics. So Benedict says this, okay, the council does represent a rupture, but in the interest of a deeper continuity, and that is what he calls a hermeneutic of reform, because all reform has to involve a certain repudiation of distortions that have crept into the church. So that that's what I mean by, and what Benedict means by the hermeneutic of reform. Yeah. <clears throat> now, talking about this reform and rupture, I would basically characterize it as an accidental rupture in some areas. I don't think it, that it is substantial 
uh, as right. far as the rupture. Whereas it yeah. seems like some of the more rad trads and some of the liberals think that there's a sub substantial rupture here. Is that how you would classify these reforms or ruptures as accidental in nature? Oh, in some senses, absolutely yes. Especially, especially with regard to the liturgical reforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if you read Sacred uh, Sacrum Concilium, in, you know, in Vatican II, the document on the liturgy, mm -hmm. it's actually calling for some very mild uh, reforms of the liturgy, uh, w without a wholesale scuttling of what came before. But then, of course, in the post conciliar era. Uh, with uh, Bishop Bagnini and others, we get the Mass of Paul VI, which really did represent. Even though I, you know, I support the Novus Ordo as a valid liturgy and all that. I mean, it, it was a far more radical rupture with the traditional Mass of the Church than than the Council really envisioned. So yeah, it, it's the Council kind of set up a dynamic, and then I think some rather ill-advised changes were made in the light of that dynamic that were not faithful to the council itself. Now, when it comes to those particular changes, the liturgical ones, especially with Bunini and, and the Concilium and the Missal of Paul VI, would you say that there's a substantial rupture with the Roman Rite here, or is there still a sufficient continuity with the Roman Rite, but some fairly significant modifications? I, I would say that it's a pretty significant rupture. I have to admit that with with regard to the to the radical traditionalists, it, I mean, it not only changes to the uh, to the vernacular. Uh, I mean, the, the priest is turned around to face the people. Uh, the liturgical action is extremely streamlined. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, I as a kid, I lived through this change. I mean, I was. I was 12 years old when the new liturgy came in, so I do remember the transition. <clears throat> and I remember I was in catechism class in the basement of my church, <coughs> excuse me, and somebody who had been to the early mass came running down to the catechism class and, and blurted out to all of us kids there, oh my God, the new mass, it's, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went to the mass and said, wow, yeah, boy, that's really different. So, but I think... That's a sort of general aesthetic impression that you get initially. But in, in reality, I mean, the, the Mass of Paul VI isn't just a valid Mass because the words of consecration are there. I mean, the accusation is that it's a kind of formless liturgy. No, it's not. I mean, all the elemental structures of the liturgy are there. All of the same elemental structures of liturgies that you saw in the old Latin Mass are there in the Novus Ordo. You know, the entrance, the, the penitential rite. All right, the 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 the, the readings, the the the, the sanctus, the preface, the offertory, the, the the Eucharistic prayer, the Lamb of God, our Father, blah blah blah, reception of communion. I mean, if that's not continuity with the old liturgy, I don't know what is. A radical rupture would be for them to just you know completely change the structure of the whole thing while maybe maintaining the words of consecration, but the elemental form is the same. Yeah. Now, I think you were briefly mentioning their implementation um, of the Second Vatican Council, and I've kind of heard you talk about this before um, in previous shows. Uh, what What would you say um, is the reason why the Second Vatican Council was so poorly implemented? It, well, let me first ask, was it poorly implemented? <laughs> Second of all, if so, uh, why do you think that is? Yes, it was poorly implemented. I, I mean, I lived, I just gave an interview with Bishop Barron out in California, and he and, you know, he and I both grew up in the same era of the church, what George Weigel called the silly season of like 65 to 1980. And yeah, it, it was very poorly implemented, and not just regard to liturgy, with regard to catechesis, which was radically changed. But more importantly, the whole tone and tenor of the church sort of collapsed overnight. And, and I think the main reason for that goes back to the formation of priests and bishops and, and laity before the Second Vatican Council. You see, this is one of the problems that I have with the Rad Trads, all right, with, the, with their nostalgia and romanticism for the pre-Vatican II Church. Something has to explain why, if the church before the council was so darn healthy, why did it collapse almost overnight? As soon as the council sort of, well, I, I like to say, as soon as the council lifted the lid off the ecclesiastical libido, uh, everything's just sort of fell fell off the charts, 
and that is because you had a lot of poorly educated and poorly formed priests and bishops. And the, and the deal is poorly formed in a very legalistic sense. The faith had been presented to them, and this goes to the failure of neo-scholastic theology and the training that these men got. It was very legalistic. It was about simply following rubrics and rules. And if you do that, then you're a good Catholic. The council tried to deepen people's spirituality by rooting it in a deeper theology. It lifted certain mandatory things like meatless Fridays and said, now choose, choose your own penance, but still do a penance. Mm -hmm. but, but notice something here. Everybody stopped doing any Friday penances at all. And that bespeaks that fundamentally legalistic attitude because the mentality was, oh, look, now it's all voluntary. Before the church mandated that I had to do this on Fridays, now they say I don't have to. So I don't have to. And, and that is what happened after the council, uh, that a legalistically formed clergy and episcopacy took the green light of the council for a more mature, adult, non-infantilized appropriation of the faith, and they took that as license to do whatever the heck they, they felt like doing. And so everybody simply writing, started writing their own theological hobby horses. And the council had the misfortune of, ha of taking place right smack dab in the middle of the 1960s, which really was the greatest cultural revolution in the history of Western culture in four or five, six hundred years. And so, I mean, the fact is these very poorly trained priests and bishops, they, they had interpreted things very legalistically. Then they fall prey to, to the cultural revolution of the 60s and the insanity of the 60s. They simply drank in and imbibed all that. They misinterpreted the council's call to read the signs of the times in order to better evangelize those times as a desire to conform to the times. And that, that was the key mistake right there. <clears throat> you know, I, it seems like some people, and I, I believe you take this position, but correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like some people take the view that, you know, John Paul II and Benedict XVI did overall did well in implementing the Second Vatican Council. W would you agree with that so far? Yes, to an extent, and I'll, I'll have, with some caveats. Yeah, and I'd like to hear what they are, because here's one of my concerns. Um, I, I look at 1986, a CC under John Paul II, and I just don't see that as a proper implementation of Lumen Gentium. Me either. Uh, so I, I have some concerns about some aspects of the pontificate of John Paul II, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything he did was bad or something like that. I mean, Oh, not at all. Yeah. Um, so w maybe comment on some of the reservations that you have about some of the things that were in John Paul II or Benedict XVI's papacy. Well, you mentioned one, the Assisi thing, which I think was a very unfortunate moment. I think what John Paul was trying to do was to promote interreligious dialogue and irrenic a more irrenic posture towards other religions. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the optics of it all came across as a very is the embracing of a kind of, hey, we're all worshiping the same God just under different symbol systems. And and that was very unfortunate because that's not what John Paul believed. If you looked at the body of his teachings, it's very clear he was not in any way, shape, or form a religious relativist. So I think in some ways his pastoral ambitions to build bridges with other religions in, in the interest of a kind of, you know, global peace of the human race outstripped his better theological judgments at that moment. I think even Pope Benedict, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, had issues with that uh, Assisi conference. I think he said so at, at one time as well. All that being said, I mean, I mean, John Paul II is a hero of mine, and yeah, no, he's Pope for 25 years or so. Obviously, he's going to make some mistakes along the way. Uh, but overall, his global impact, his encyclicals, his teachings, they, it's just magnific a magnificent body of teaching that he left behind that gives us the proper retrieval and hermeneutic of the Second Vatican Council. But it all got scuttled. It, did, it didn't... His teachings were fantastic, but they didn't move the needle too much of the church in a proper direction. Because as in a conversation I once had with George Weigel, who was, of course, the biographer of John Paul II, 
Weigel once said, I hope he doesn't mind me revealing this because it was over a couple of scotches. Uh, he, he said, John Paul was a, was a, uh, a great uh, prophet, a good priest, but a lousy king. Okay. And in the sense that in the midst of his global, you know, his, his geopolitics, his, his fixation on helping to bring down the Soviet Union, his fixation on buttressing up global Catholicism by all of his travels around the world, he pretty much turned the governance of the church to underlings. And many of them were incompetent. And worse than that, many of them did not have the church's best interests at heart. And so, for example, I was a university professor, and anybody involved in the university academic theological world at that time could tell you that the academy was completely dominated by liberals, progressives, totally done. You had these little pinpricks of orthodox, little small, tiny, very insulated places, you know, Thomas More College, you know, Steubenville, a little bit bigger. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, the big, big, big Catholic universities were all liberals. So John Paul issues Ex Corde Ecclesiae, that document that was meant to reform the teaching of theology in, in Catholic universities and Catholic universities in general, to bolster their Catholic identity. And in there, there was a call for all theologians teaching in Catholic universities to get a mandatum, a mandate from their bishop attesting to their orthodoxy in teaching theology. But it was a toothless document. It was never really enforced. It was never really implemented. And most bishops just gave it a blind eye and said, well, whatever. And to the extent that they imposed the mandatum, they just gave a blanket mandatum to every single theologian in their, in their diocese. Say, like, if you were in Chicago or someplace, okay, and you have all these Catholic universities in New York, the, the, the Cardinal Archbishop would simply say, eh, all of you have a mandatum. There you go. It, mm. it, it, so to me, that was a symbol of what was wrong with John Paul's papacy on the level of governance. He let, even though he was up here teaching orthodox theology and retrieving the council, he let the general drift of liberal progressive Catholicism to continue. And it still dominated everything, which is why you see now, now that Benedict is no longer, you know, Pope and Francis is Pope and he seems to be a little bit more liberal, all of a sudden you see an explosion of all of these same guys. Uh, who It's like we've been returned to 1970 and it's because they never went away. It's because they were, this mythology that the press has put forward, the media has put forward, this mythology that the church took this hard right turn under John Paul and Benedict is patently false and anybody who has worked in the church for the past 45, 50 years, can tell you how false it is. Uh, up in Rome, everything was orthodox. The center was holding, but the rest of the church was still spinning off in progressive directions. Now, you mentioned Pope, uh, Pope Francis there. Uh, tell me a little bit about your opinion on the implementation of the Second Vatican Council uh, during this pontificate. Well, I think what we're seeing is a return, as I just said, mm -hmm. to, to the thought form thought world of around 1970 mm -hmm. i think i think that it is now abundantly clear that even though pope francis is thoroughly orthodox i disagree with those rad treads who say he's a heretic i don't think he's a heretic uh but i i do think that his vision of the council is not the same as that of john paul and benedict i think francis does view the council according to what, what we call in theology the Bologna school of, of theology, uh, the Bologna Italy theologians, that school did advocate for a hermeneutic of rupture, that the council really did represent a very, not a mild break with certain recent distortions, but a pretty significant break with, with the form and structure of Tridentine Catholicism in particular, post-Trent Catholicism in particular. Uh, and I think Francis is more of a practitioner of that hermeneutic of rupture than John Paul and Benedict were. And I think that's why he's come down hard now on the traditional Latin Mass people. As Sean Blanchard has said in a great, great article, I can't remember where now, or even the title of it, so excuse me for bringing up a, an article, I don't know the title of the source, but Sean Blanchard, he says that, that this the uh, Tradiciones Custodes wasn't about liturgy at all. 
it was really about retrieving the council and that the traditional Latin Mass and Summorum Pontificum of Benedict XVI represented a form of conciliar retrieval that Francis just doesn't agree with. Uh, and, and that he wants, he wants to put uh, the conciliar retrieval more back in line with that of Paul VI and what was going on in the 70s uh, than he does, I think, with the papacies of John Paul and Benedict. I could be utterly wrong about that. Uh, but, you know, and on the other hand, I, I don't think Pope Francis is a liberal in that very progressive sense. I mean, let's look at the laundry list of issues that he has not given to the liberals. He has not okayed married priests. He has not okayed women priests. He hasn't even okayed female deacons. He hasn't changed the teaching on contraception. He hasn't changed the teaching on intercommunion with Protestants. Okay, so and, and he, these are all things that progressives, that's on their wish list. That's top and center on their wish list, and he hasn't given them any of those. Uh, and, and so his papacy is actually a very strange mixture of a kind of orthodox, conservative Catholicism on some issues, but I think on a pastoral level is where, we have to remember, Francis is the mind of a pastor, and what he's after isn't changing major disciplines or doctrines. What he is after, I think, is just an entirely different pastoral mindset about how we need to meet the faithful on the ground. And there you get all of his favorite metaphors, churches, field hospital, accompaniment, those kinds of things. If you want the key to the Francis papacy, it's right there. And it's pastoral rather than doctrinal. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to the Second Vatican Council, some are going to criticize it and say that it was overly optimistic in the way that it viewed mankind at the time. Would you agree with that? And number two, why do you think it was that way? Yes, I do agree with it. I, I think the council, though I, I completely support it, and I reject the claim that it's an irrelevant council that we just need to ignore now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, all councils are not pertinent. No council's perfect. All councils have their flaws, and this one was no exception. I, I, I've said in a blog post, I think the council was, was guilty of a double naivete. And the first naivete was, I think, the count, council fathers had an overly optimistic appraisal of the internal faith life of the church. I think because all of the outward structures of the church seem to be still so vibrant, so bustling with life. I mean, here in the United States, for example, 1950s Catholicism saw this like explosion of, of, of Catholic orders, Catholic vocations, Catholic schools, Catholic mass attendance. So outwardly, it just seemed like there was this great vitality and strength in the church. But, all, but if you go back and read some of the great theologians of the preconciliar church, and even literary figures like Georges Bernanos, or, but you read people like Peggy and Guardini and Ratzinger in his famous article in 1958 called The New Paganism in the Church, people were sounding the alarm bells that all was not well in the church, that there was a deep rot in the church, a lukewarmness, a mediocrity, and the council fathers are, are guilty of not listening to that and having a naivete about the strength. They thought that they could just sort of lift all of these sorts of rules, if you will, and that people would just embrace a more adult approach to the faith. Uh, but in reality, they were not up for it. That's the first. The second naivete is what you just alluded to. I think the council fathers had an overly optimistic view of how ready, how open the modern world was to dialoguing with the Catholic Church. I don't think they understood at all how toxic the modern world and its worldview actually is to Catholicism. And so I think that many of them were sort of shocked and surprised when, the, when they set about the task of dialoguing with the modern world to find out the modern world had no interest in dialoguing with us. The modern world had only an interest in dismissing us or conquering us. Uh, and to which then many bishops and priests simply waved the white flag and said, okay, fine, we'll go along with you. Why this optimistic perspective after the Holocaust and World War II? And wouldn't you have a really negative view of mankind in light of that? I, I don't get the optimism. Help me out here. I think that uh, the Council Fathers precisely because of world and we have to remember the council gets called 17 years after the close of world war ii 
I mean, th- 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 you know, it's what's 17 years from 2021 where, where, you know, where we are now. It's like 2003 or four or something like that, uh, which it just seems like recent memory to us. So, yeah, this is all fresh in their mind. But you can have one of two reactions to the catastrophe of the Second World War. You can either spin off in the direction of a deep cynicism and a deep pessimism and say, you know, human beings are just trousered apes and we just have to hunker down and do something about these violent strengths we have. Or you can go in the opposite direction and say, this really was kind of the war to end all wars. And and we now know that we have to come together globally as a human race in order to put behind us all of these various isms. Otherwise, we're going to succumb to to terror and, and darkness and, and more and more holocausts and so on. So I think the optimism wasn't really deep. In some ways, I think it was a kind of whistling past the graveyard optimism. Mm. I I think it really was a kind of let's cross our fingers and let's put our eggs in the basket of a more optimistic approach. Uh, United Nations, all that kind of stuff, global community. Because I think in, in, in the minds of these council fathers who lived through the war, that's our only option. The, the other option is to go back to balkanized ethnocentric hatreds. Uh, and the church is, after all, a global institution and trying to build you know, the, the brotherhood of, of man and all that stuff. And so I, I think they just had this, this desire for that reality be tr- to be true. I, I, I'm not certain how deep the hope actually went. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that makes sense. Now, one of the things that I noticed in the opening speech of John the 23rd uh, for the Second Vatican Council is, of course, this emphasis on the medicine of mercy rather than condemnation and taking that approach. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that that was the right approach or do you think that maybe that wasn't necessarily the best move? I think that it was a good move and a bad move at the same time, depending, and I hate to be so yes and no, straddling the fence, but these are complicated sociological as well as theological issues, and, and we have to understand that the causes of the, of the problems after the church are multifocal, uh, uh, coming from all kinds of different directions, a sort of perfect storm of factors coming together. But yeah, uh, we have to understand, people didn't live through it. Before the Second Vatican Council, you, you were still in a situation where the, the church had a forbidden index of books and, 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 you know, books you could read and books you were not allowed to read. And it was very, very quick and easy for a theologian, even a, an Orthodox theologian like a Henry de Lubac, the Jesuit, who John Paul later made a cardinal. He was silenced under Pius XII at the behest of people like Gary Goulagrange and other neo-scholastics. So th- there was a very... It really was a church of of scoping out error. It was a defensive church, post Reformation, post rationalism of the Enlightenment, post scientific revolution, post Darwin, the ch- and then the loss of the papal states and the church feeling besieged on all sides. It was a circle the wagons mentality, and it was a condemn error mentality, and a finger wagging mentality to maintain a strong, what some had called, fortress Catholicism. And this is what John XXIII was trying to dismantle. He was, and because it was all utterly superficial. One of the reasons why, for example, so much bad theology came out right after the council was because tons and tons and tons of theologians, who are mostly priests, had written all kinds of dissenting and heretical books before the council, but had squirreled them away inside their their you know their offices and only you know copy them mimeograph them for for you know special eyes to look at and read pass them around amongst their friends but when john the 23rd lifted all of that all of these books just sort of exploded onto the market all at once uh, I was taught by the moral theologian Germain Grizet when I was in uh, Mount St. Mary Seminary, and this was what Grizet pointed out to me, because he was old enough to remember. He had all these colleagues who had all these manuscripts squirreled away in, in their desks, and they were just waiting to have... So all of this is simply my way of saying that John the Twenty Third understood something, that repression didn't really solve the root problem. 
It made it go underground, but it didn't solve the problem. And the problem was simply a lack of evangelical, adult, non-infantilized faith. Faith that wasn't rooted in pharisaical legalisms. And so John the Twenty-Third, you know, famous aggiornamento, the opening of the windows, the extending of mercy rather than anathemas and condemnation. Now that was all the good, but the bad side, as we've already talked about, there was also a powerful naivete in all of that. A powerful naivete, because it simply went from condemnation and repression to, okay, do whatever you want. And, 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 and green lighted everything. And once, once that explosion happens, then things actually spin out of the papacy's control. Uh, I mean, there's this myth out there that the Pope can do anything, that he can control everything, but it's simply not true. Once the life of the church takes on a trajectory and an agenda, deeply entrenched all its own in a global way with bishops and priests and nuns all jumping on board. It's extremely hard, as we saw with John Paul's ex corde ex Clase, to simply legislate a problem away from Rome, which, by the way, is why I don't agree with Pope Francis's motu proprio, because it's once again an attempt by Rome to legislate away a problem that's rooted in a much deeper existential crisis of faith. Mm. You know, really quickly there about the index, why not deal with both? Why not deal with the root plot problem that you were noting and forbid heretical books? Why, why not have both? Well, in a sense, they did. Uh, they got rid of the forbidden index of books, but we have to remember the the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, continued to exist, uh, and it continued to exercise its its oversight on, on theological works. And, and what would happen is that if a theologian put out a book that was uh, uh, really beyond the pale, then the CDF would, would, uh, would issue a warning about it and would issue a warning to the author. But, but the, the warnings were often rather toothless. I mean, one, the two of the fewest examples I can think of where the CDF actually came down on theologians was uh, John Paul's move against Hans Kung. Yeah. Where he, but even there, for example, he was just stripped of his canonical right to teach at a, at a canonical Catholic institution. He wasn't silenced. He could still publish. He could still preach. He was still a priest. He could still teach, just not with a canonical mandate. And then Leonardo Boff in, in South America, uh, who was teaching some rather heretical, questionable stuff, and he was sort of silenced for a time. But uh, I think Pope Francis has sort of rehabilitated him. Uh, and so th there were a few examples here and there. There. But it almost always with, was with theologians who had simply become very popular, uh, you, who were moving the needle, as I like to say, of, of the Catholic world. But it utterly ignored, which the Forbidden Index of Books had, had not ignored, it utterly ignored the thousands and thousands of heretical books that were out there written by second, third, and fourth tier theologians teaching at St. Fidgeta College in, you know, Dog Breath, Nebraska, or someplace like that. I, I'm making fun of my own home state now, Nebraska, but uh, but you get the point. <laughs> That's a new one. You know, when it comes circling back to the medicine of mercy there from uh, John the 23rd, when it comes to implementation of the Second Vatican Council, we hear that expression in the current pontificate, medicine of mercy. Um <clears throat> You, you mentioned that there's a sense in which you think that that wasn't necessarily the best approach, taking this medicine of mercy rather than condemnation. Do you think that that is the case today, this approach that uh, Pope Francis takes today, where he believes he's implementing the Second Vatican Council under this medicine of mercy? Do you think that maybe that is problematic and we need more teeth behind uh, certain condemnations? I, I think that we need more teeth definitely, behind uh, the policing of, of the theological ranks. But, but with full realization that the council and John the Twenty Third were correct, it, it can't, it, it's, we have, in other words, I don't have all the answers, and I don't pretend to have all the answers. There's got to be a balance between the extreme that we see today, if anything goes, and the old forbidden index of books where even a de Lubac could be silenced. There's got to be some kind of a middle path of discipline and mercy at the same time. So I agree. Uh, John Paul simply tried to correct, uh, right the ship by simply having extremely good teaching 
constantly issuing from Rome. And the idea being that if Rome held firm, then eventually people will come around and things will percolate up from below. I remember as a young theologian, everyone was talking about, oh, the new young John Paul II generation of Catholics that are coming up, they're going to change everything. And that's John Paul's long vision strategy. You know, he's going to energize the base of devout Catholics and over time they'll replace the liberals wrong. They didn't. Uh, and, and therein lies the problem. There needed to be more teeth and things like ex corde, ecclesiae, and so on. I remember one time St. Joseph's University, which is a Jesuit school in Philadelphia, was holding some sort of queer fin film festival or drag queen film festival or, or, or something along those lines. And so devout Catholics in Philadelphia rightly complained to Archbishop Chaput. And, and Chaput basically, oh, there's nothing I can do. It's a Jesuit school. They do their own thing. I mean, I can issue a statement saying, hey, this is bad. Uh, but, but beyond that, I really can't do anything. Uh, yeah, you can, Archbishop. And therein lies the problem. Uh, we, we, in other words, my point is that if it's just going to come down hard from Rome, in a centralized juridical way, it's not going to work. This thing has got to happen uh, all over the world globally with bishops having having the, the nerve and the courage to do something about, because they know their diocese is better than the folks in Rome do. And so there's got to be this. But, you know, you know, to go back to Pope Francis, too, you know, this this medicine of mercy. I, I wrote in one blog, for example, you know, of course, Pope Francis loves this field hospital, field hospital metaphor. And you know what? It's a good metaphor. The church is a field hospital. And I agree with that completely. And I think the Pope's sentiments are in the right place. At the same time, we need to remember a field hospital is an extension of a real hospital. And the chief function of a hospital is to heal and to cure, not to simply sit by a bed while somebody dies of something that you could cure them of. I'm going to hold your hand, even though I'm holding in my other hand, the cure for the disease that ails you, but I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, and, and that's the sort of bind that I, it, all too often, people who run with this field hospital medicine of mercy metaphor, all they mean is, we're never going to call anybody out. We're never going to challenge anybody to holiness. We're never going to challenge anybody to come out of hell and rise up eschatologically into the heavenly ranks. Uh, the field hospital apparently is just a place where we're just going to keep people on gurneys in the corridor and hold their hands. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And you mentioned their traditionis custodis, and I would, um, I'd like to ask a, a little bit about that. Would you say, well, let me first say this. When I read it, I thought, well, it's nice that he is condemning liturgical abuses in both forms of the Roman Rite, that he's uh, concerned with liturgical abuses in the Novus Ordo, because he does, does mention that. Um, but I think one of the biggest problems that, well, yeah, one of the biggest problems that I have with it is he puts no teeth behind it. He just condemns it, but doesn't do anything about people who are going to continue to engage in this liturgical abuse. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, I think you've nailed it right there. Uh, I think that the only teeth that are in that document are directed at uh, people in the traditional Latin mass movement. Now, as you well know, I have a lot of big issues with the rad trads, mm -hmm. and I have a big issue, and I think some of the problems that the Pope identifies within the rad trad movement, you know, the sort of remnant church versus the false church mentality mm -hmm. that so many of them seem to have, anti-Vatican II, all that, He's right. That's there. But then you also have you also have abuses on the other side. And so where's the teeth in that regard? Where's where's his teeth with regard to the Germans right now with their synodal way? Why doesn't he issue a motu proprio saying, uh, no more synodal way, Germans. I'm hereby shutting down your synodal way because it's very clear where you're taking it. You're, you, you very publicly have stated where you're taking it. The CDF has issued documents against where you're taking it, and yet you continue to take it in those directions. So here's my motu proprio squashing you little bugs too and 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 he hasn't done that and it is I, I I think it's because his sympathies lie in that direction yeah uh, I, I think in his heart you know in other words human nature is human nature right and if, if you're fundamentally a conservative person you're going to be sympathetic with the the nut jobs on the right of you 
because, well, at least their heart's in the right place because at least they're conservatives. And it's the same with liberals. I think the Pope thinks the Germans are a big fat pain in the rear. I think he wishes they would shut up and go away. But he's fundamentally more liberal than some recent popes, and I think his attitude is, well, no enemies to the left of me. And, uh, uh, you know, their heart's in the right place. So I'm just going to give a wink and a nod and let them go their merry way and deal with them down the road. So I, I think that's the best analysis that I can give what's going on here. Like I said, he has not given the traditional, uh, the, 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 the liberals their wish list of issues. And I don't think he wants the Germans to go down that path. But I think he has a far more liberal disposition than John Paul and Benedict did. And so I think he's far more willing to go, to bend over backwards in that direction than he is with the traditionalists, who I think he absolutely loathes. <coughs> I don't think he like. let's put it this way. I don't think he likes the Latin Mass at all. And I think he hopes that it simply goes away. That's what, that, 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 I, th I think that's the bottom line. <clears throat> let's uh, briefly talk about should the Second Vatican Council have happened? Uh, if so, what do you think it should have? <laughs> <laughs> well, always remember, hindsight is twenty twenty, right. and and the, nobody at the council, I think, could have predicted exactly how far the cultural revolution of the sixties and seventies was going to go, and what an upheaval it was going to create in the church. I think if everybody at the council had, you know, knowing what they knew, say by nineteen seventy five could do do a, what we call in golf a, a mulligan, a sort of do-over after slicing your tee shot. I, I, I think that they would have said, can we, can we go back and do this again? Uh, at least some of them, I think, would have. I think Joseph Rotzinger has certain reservations about, you know, maybe we should have done things a little differently in the council in the light of what came after. But should the council have happened? Absolutely, yes. And, and I'm working on a book on this topic for, for, uh, uh, word on fire and one for Ignatius Press too. And it's, it's, it's essentially this. We need to remember that modernity, that period of human history that really began in the Enlightenment and the, and the uh, Reformation and the scientific revolution, then going forward into Darwinism and modern technocracy and so forth, modernity represents the single greatest sea change in the history of human culture ever, ever. And it represents, therefore, the most foundational challenge and crisis to the church ever, because it strikes at the very root of everything. Uh, like, for example, in the early century of the church, it had to deal with Gnosticism, which was a very, very dangerous heresy in the early church. It appealed to lots of people. But you know what? At least paganism, at least Gnosticism, involved people who believed in spiritual things supernatural things. So when you're engaging them in debate, you're you're engaging people who still are thinking within the ambit of the classical worldview, within the ambit of the view that there are things beyond the material realm. The modern world is a world of radical agnosticism, atheism, disbelief, radical materialism, and the philosophical materialism, not consumerism. And, and it represents this foundational, therefore, that is why the council had to be called, because the church had to address these challenges. Certain theologians before the council, like the what the the communio, the resource month theologians, the Nouvelle Theologie, De Lubac, Guardini, Ratzinger, Balthazar, guys like this, they were trying to address Guardini in particular. He was waving that red flag like crazy. Uh, you know, he wrote all of these books about the modern world and what it, what the challenge it was facing to the church, and yet neo scholastic theology would have none of it. It just simply said, oh, the modern world, it's all wrong. We just need to reiterate our dogmas and dig our head in the sand and we're going to be fine. That's a caricature, but by golly, that it's not much because that's why people like, like De Lubac got silenced. And so the council had to be called in order to validate resourcement theology. I mean, there were three factions at the council, the neo-scholastics, the resourcement guys, the back to the patristics and scripture guys. Then, in other words, the resourcement guys wanted Aquinas, but they wanted to read Aquinas through the lens of the fathers. And that's terribly important. They wanted to retrieve a broader Aquinas as opposed to the neo-scholastics. The third group were the progressives who simply wanted to accommodate to the world. The council validated resourcement theology. The council was a resourcement council. 
However, after the Council, the progressives won the media battle, and they won the battle in the academy. And that's why the Resource Month guys got marginalized and why the Council largely failed in its pastoral objectives. But this is why the Council had to be called. It had to be called in order to acknowledge the crisis we face and to validate the theology that was the answer to that crisis, at least the Church's answer to that crisis. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the post-conciliar crazy season derailed all of that. Here's... Um a question from Jared. Will the current issues in the church caused by misrepresentations of Vatican II need to be addressed or solved by a Vatican III? And if so, what issues uh, should a Vatican III focus on? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I, I often have these dreams of a Vatican III. Uh, but I, to be honest with you, uh, I think it would be a catastrophe. I just don't, ecumenical councils only work if the problems that need to be addressed are addressed by a, a church that is still fundamentally in agreement on foundational issues. The church is not in fundamental agreement on foundational issues right now. And I think a Vatican III would unleash a hailstorm I would use stronger language, but we're we're on the interwebs. Uh, a hailstorm of controversy that that might do far more damage than good. Rather, what I would like to see is either the current pope or the next pope to devote their entire the rest either Francis the rest of his papacy or the next pope his entire papacy to encyclical after encyclical synod after synod on how to retrieve the council properly. What is the theology we need in order to retrieve the council properly? Now, in order to do that, we have to have the right pope. And I, I actually like Pope Francis. I'm not an enemy of Pope Francis at all. He's not a heretic. I have qualms about it, but I have qualms about all popes. Uh, I, I don't have the issues, but nevertheless, I don't think Pope Francis is the Pope to call the Vatican III, and I don't think he's going to be the Pope that resolves these issues, because he seems to be, uh, he seems to be on one side of the divide, rather than someone who's trying to sort of bring divisions together. Uh, I, I think the, the next Pope, in my hope, would be a Pope far more congenial to the vision of the resource month theologians, to, to, the, to the vision of John Paul in, in, and Benedict in particular. And once again, it's not that I'm opposed to Pope. Pope Francis, we have to, Pope Francis is not an intellectual. He's not, he's not dumb. He's a very smart man and he's very educated. He is a Jesuit after all. But he is not, he is not the theologian that Benedict was and he's not the philosopher that John Paul was. He is a pastor in his soul. And I, I'm not certain that he's got Let's put it this way. I don't think he wants to delve into those issues. He's been Pope eight years, whatever, and he hasn't delved into those issues, and I don't think he wants to. I think he feels like it's not in his wheelhouse. So unfortunately, I think we're kind of in limbo right now, <clears throat> and we're just going to have to try and work our way through this as best we can, realizing that Christ, when John the Twenty Third went to bed every night, his prayer was, Lord, I'm going to bed now. It's your church. Take care of things. There's or, or words to that effect. And I think we, we need to all sit back and take a deep breath and say, the church has been, you know, in bad shape before. There are lots and lots of vibrant things going on in the church right now. It's not all darkness and chaos and cacophony. There, there's a lot of fundamental things going on that are good. And let's take a deep breath, pray for the Pope, push our own vision, amicably, irenically, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and then uh, pray to the Holy Spirit that it will guide us out of these problems. Weinschel asks, <clears throat> in what ways can the Council be retrieved properly, as you suggested? Well, I, I, I think for starters, the Council has to be, as I've, I've said over and over again, it has to be let, read through the lens of the resource mont theologians that that were vindicated at that council and were and and were uh, sort of it's it, it animated it. In particular, uh, I don't want to get too technical theologically. In embracing resource mont theology, theology and someone like Henry de Lubac in particular, the council was endorsing a particular vision of the relationship between nature and grace. Now, Michael, you probably know all about this debate, too, you know, as to whether or not God is 
even for our natural human nature, our final end, or whether that end is something that's sort of added on to a human nature that's pretty much self-enclosed all by itself. Uh, de Lubac argued for the idea that Thomas Aquinas taught that even to our natural humanity, God is our final end, and 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 therefore grace represents the deepest fulfillment of our human nature. Uh, my blog, Gaudium et Spes 22, is, is rooted in that idea. The, the Gaudium et Spes 22 means the 22nd section of Gaudium et Spes, Church in the Modern World, which the main line in there that John Paul quoted in every one of his encyclicals, that it's only in the light of Christ that the mystery of man makes basically makes sense. So there's a Christocentric anthropology that is going on in Second Vatican Council that is the direct result of the Resourcement guys. And, and I think th that has implications across the board for church-state relations, church-world relations, and so on. It's way too complicated to get into here. Uh, but it, it bespeaks the fact that the council was superficially retrieved. Oh, it's a liberalizing council. It's just a council that's basically saying conform yourself to the world. So we, we don't even need to bother the theology that animated it and so on. And, and that's just furthest thing from the truth. The deal is that the theology that it represents has been eclipsed and replaced with something else, and, and that's a sad thing. So I would start there. I would say, go back, read Guardini, read, read De Lubac, read Ratzinger, read Louis Bouillet, read Balthasar, read these guys. That theological project and their approach to my, is the project of the council. So in a sense, retrieving the council means retrieving those guys. And, and, and their heirs in the modern theological academy, people like David L. Schindler, who teaches at the John Paul II Institute in Washington, D.C., and his son, uh, David Christopher Schindler, who also teaches there. People like Nicholas Healy, Dave Crawford, Antonio Lopez, they all teach down there. These are the heirs of the Resource Mont theologians, and I think they need to be listened to far more. In fact, they're the they're the uh, editors of the journal Communio, which was started by Ratzinger, Balthasar, and De Lubac in order to properly retrieve the council. And that journal is still in place. So I think people need to subscribe to Communio, read what's in there, and, and understand the vision that it's espousing. And that's the vision that I think we need to be bringing to Vatican II. Nick Monk asks, uh, should the average Catholic just put their trust in the dogma of the indefectibility of the church? and carry on with their devotions and not read all the criticisms of the Pope. I think there's great wisdom in that. Uh, I'm incapable of doing that simply because I'm an egg-headed nerd and I just can't stop thinking about all this stuff. And that's, I don't know if that's a virtue or a vice. It's probably a little bit of both. Uh, but still, I, you know, I think that this is a great question, by the way. Thank you for it. Because it helps, it, it gives me the chance to say this. 95% of Catholics that are out there around the world have never heard of anything that I'm talking about today. Uh, and nor do they care to hear, and it's not important for them to hear. Because they've, like you've just, in your question, they've got their devotions, they've got their spirituality, they attend to the sacraments, they have their family life, their community, their friends. And what the latest letter from Archbishop Vigano has to say about Freemason infiltration of the church, they don't care. They don't care. All right. So, like, I was just on Bishop Barron's show. Every, you know, lots of people know Bishop Barron. But then you know, I was telling some of my friends about it, Catholic friends. I'm going on Bishop Barron's show, and they say, well, who's Bishop Barron? And, you know, I'm, like, dumbfounded because, like, wait a minute. Who's Bishop Barron? You've never heard of Bishop Barron? No. And that really hit home to me and reminded me how many Catholics are not really concerned with all of these big picture issues in the church. And they're just, they've got their nose to the spiritual grindstone. And they're just working at their salvation in fear and trembling, uh, living for the Lord. And God bless them. Was there any buildup or signs of an upcoming council back during the reign of Pius XII? Yes. In fact, after Vatican, remember, Vatican I ended abruptly and was never officially closed. And it ended abruptly because of political revolution going on in Italy at the time. And many popes, almost all popes, after Vatican I, talked openly about, well, maybe I should do Vatican II. Uh, you know, Pius XI thought about it, Pius XII thought about it. But, you know, a lot of events intervened to stop that. 
uh, it would have been hard to hold the Vatican II, say, during World War I in its aftermath. It would have been hard to hold Vatican II in pre-World War II Europe and, and World War II and, and the post immediate post-war years. There, and, of course, the Great Depression. There was so much going on. In, in those sort of hundred years in between the two councils. And so that's why, yeah, lots of popes talked about it, but none of them thought the time was ripe or opportune. And that's why the world was shocked and his own advisors were shocked when John the 23rd said, hey, let's do a council. Let, let's do Vatican II. And maybe he thought he was the perfect pope to do it because he was already old and kind of a caretaker pope, an interim pope without, without a lot of axes to grind or theological agendas. So maybe he thought he... By the way, John the Twenty Third literally thought, read uh, Seawald's biography of, of Pope Benedict and it comes out. John the Twenty Third thought the Second Vatican Council would last about three months and all the bishops would come and basically sign off on the on the pre-written schemas that had been written up, and everybody would then go home. Uh, he didn't envision some sort of long, three-year-long revolutionary council uh, at all. Uh, and, and I think that's the way most popes envisioned calling a second Vatican council. I think they just saw it as, well, we just need to finish up, mop up what Vatican I didn't finish. And I think that's kind of what John Twenty Third thought, too. And uh, But nobody thought that it was going to be this wholesale, this wholesale big-time council that lasted three years. Dr. Chap, I really want to thank you for coming on and doing this show. You are always welcome on. I'd love to have you back on to talk love about to, any topic that you're interested in, really. I absolutely love I love your show. Love your show. I'd love to come back. I appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk about that off the air and see if we can uh, set up another one. And uh, once again, thank you for coming on. And everybody, I appreciate y'all watching. Don't forget to, of course, like and subscribe. Share this on your social media. Um, and of course, check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you'd like to support us, you'll also get access to extra content. That's going to do it, everybody. Uh, thank y'all for watching. God bless you all. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? The truth is many of us spend our lives running from distraction to distraction. And even for dedicated Catholics, our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life, made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. Combining the practices of Catholic faithful throughout time with the science of personal productivity, the Saint Maker will help you grow in virtue and structure your spiritual life while getting organized and achieving ambitious goals. And that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is a beautiful, easy to carry, and well crafted companion to your Missal, Bible, and Rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and much more. There are lots of great Catholics using the Saint Maker, like Scott Williams, CEO of Sock Religious, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Dina Parka and Amber Schneider, and priests like Father Dean Marshall and Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. Visit thesaintmaker.com forward slash reason and theology to shop the planners and to start your Saint Maker journey today.